Hello everyone. It's now been three days since the dictatorship of Azerbaijan began its full-scale military assault on the 120,000 Armenian Christians of Nagorno-Karabakh. It's been two days uh, since the government of Nagorno-Karabakh agreed to stop resisting and engage in negotiations with the government of Azerbaijan. As I said yesterday, the moment that we're in is still extremely dangerous. It might seem like there's not a lot going on, but the reality is we don't know very much about what's going on because Azerbaijan has deliberately destroyed the communications infrastructure of Nagorno-Karabakh. They destroyed the electrical grid and they bombed several communications antennas. Um, so I'll put up a graph on the screen in a moment that comes from NetBlocks. I'll link to their, their account in the description below. Um, but you can see there's been a massive drop off in communications from Nagorno-Karabakh since the war started. Um, to add to that, Azerbaijani troops control most of the roads in the territory. There are many villages that are cut off from the rest of Nagorno-Karabakh and between the road blockades and the communications blackout, we really have no idea what's going on inside these villages. Um, there are of course terrible rumors and terrible fears because every time Azerbaijan has conquered Armenian territory in the past seven years, they have carried out atrocities against Armenians who they have captured there, who have been left behind. So this is very likely the moment when atrocities are taking place or they're about to take place. Um, yesterday, after I uploaded my video, uh, the representatives of the government of Nagorno-Karabakh were negotiating with the representatives of the government of Azerbaijan in a city hundreds of kilometers away. And during those negotiations, Azerbaijani troops began shelling and firing on Stepanakert, the capital city of Nagorno-Karabakh. Our friends there called us, they let us know what was happening. Um, it seems that Azerbaijan backed off relatively quickly after that. It's possible that this was just a, a terror technique to show the Armenian negotiators that there could still be mass atrocities if they don't give in to all of Azerbaijan's demands at these essentially surrender negotiations that are ongoing. Um, so the situation remains extremely tense. Um, there are many wounded people in these villages that are blocked off from the rest of the territory who can't be evacuated to Stepanakert for medical treatment. Uh, many of them are dying um, and no one can be evacuated from the territory itself. The, the territory is blocked off, no one can leave. Um, it's unclear exactly what it would take for Azerbaijan to allow these people to leave. There are different reports circulating that Azerbaijan has a list of people that they want to arrest or that um, everyone has to be checked before they go. Um, we really don't know what's going to happen. But again, virtually every male, adult male in Nagorno-Karabakh has done military service and then is potentially a target uh, for Azerbaijan. Um, there are around 50,000 people who are homeless right now. They were driven out of their villages by the assault. Um, many thousands of them have gathered at the airport in Stepanakert, hoping for an evacuation. Um, but this airport has been closed for 30 years because Azerbaijan always promised to shoot any plane that came into it or came out of it, shoot down that plane. So there are no planes, and as far as we know, there are no plans to bring any planes. Uh, so those people are not able to evacuate for the time being. Um, the situation is very grim. Um, when we have more news, we'll share it. Uh, what we know for sure is that there are people who are sick and wounded and hungry who aren't getting the aid that they need. Um, and we have no way of knowing if there are atrocities happening in the outlying villages, but it should be considered relatively likely. Excuse me there. The author Thomas Duvall, a British journalist and historian of the Caucasus, comments that what he's seeing now reminds him of the first days of the war in Bosnia, or the genocide in Bosnia. Um, that it's a dangerous moment with no resumption of food deliveries, thousands of people displaced from their homes, Azerbaijani soldiers moving at will, and credible reports of atrocities coming in already. Yesterday, the UN Security Council met to discuss the crisis. Um, it was quite a dismal affair. 
I'll put the, the link to the transcript from the UN um, in the notes here, but really no country had anything substantial to say other than that they're deeply concerned. Some of them condemned Azerbaijan for launching this military assault, but none of them supported Armenia's request for a Security Council resolution to bring in humanitarian aid to ask for withdrawal of Azerbaijani troops and to explore a UN peacekeeping mandate. Um, and also yesterday, it seems that President Joe Biden invited the foreign minister of Azerbaijan for a private reception at the United Nations. And there's a photo that the Azerbaijani foreign minister posted to his Twitter account showing him take, shaking hands with the president of the United States and smiling while all of this is going on. This is an, an enormous disgrace, obviously. Um, one wonders if Biden even knows what his subordinates have said about, quote, not countenancing an act of ethnic cleansing by Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh or being deeply concerned about Azerbaijan's military assault. But I think President Biden's photo op with the foreign minister of this genocidal dictatorship happening right now as the war and the genocide are underway is an instructive point. That there was no reason for Biden to do this at all. If he had skipped this photo op, if he had politely declined, if he had forgotten to invite the foreign minister, no one would have noticed this. No one would have been bothered. This tells us that the White House feels zero pressure on this issue. They, they're effectively not even aware of it. Um, and that's very discouraging, but it also means that a little pressure might go a long way. This is not an issue that's been politicized yet. This is not an issue that everyone already has a position about. This is not an issue where the White House is expecting to hear from people about this. So if they do start hearing from people, we have to try. We have to keep speaking out. We have to keep advocating for our brothers and sisters in Nagorno-Karabakh who are under attack, facing atrocities, facing an extremely uncertain future. The, the lives of this population and the question of their survival is going to be decided in the next few days. Um, so please keep doing whatever you're doing. Um, keep calling the White House, keep calling your representatives, keep trying to make this an issue as best as you can. Um, CSI is continuing to advocate this. Um, we're, we're pressing every lever that's at our disposal. We're doing uh, media interviews, we're releasing statements, we're contacting government representatives, and we're also mobilizing aid uh, for the outflux of refugees in Armenia that we're expecting due to this crisis. I want to finish with, with two points. Um, there's a video now circulating around that was taken by an extraordinary journalist from Nagorno-Karabakh named Siranush Sarkeesian. It's a video interview with a woman named Sofik who witnessed one of the early bombings on Tuesday or Wednesday. And this woman, Sofik, says, quote, uh, when the bombing started, we gathered the kids in one area under some trees to see if we can get them to safety, and that's where they hit. Some children died, some were wounded, some were in critical condition, some had their brains spilled out. Sofik has five children. Three of them are in the hospital right now. One is taking shelter in a basement in Stepanakert, and the fifth, she doesn't know where this child is because her daughter was in school when the bombing started, and so she was evacuated with the other students, and they've been separated, and they can't get in touch. Finally, um, there's a report in the Turkish media an interview with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey, who is a strong ally of Azerbaijan. And in this interview, President Erdogan says that the president of Azerbaijan came to him and thanked him for his support during this war and told him, quote, they won't be able to breathe there anymore. This is what President Erdogan told this Turkish journalist that the president of Azerbaijan told him. So when you hear perhaps conciliatory statements coming from the Azerbaijani leadership about rights for Armenians or integration or a reconciliation process. Just remember this quote. This is what the Turkish leadership and Azerbaijani leadership are saying to their own people in their own language. 
that they don't expect the Armenians will be able to breathe in Nagorno-Karabakh anymore. Ethnic cleansing is the goal, genocide is the goal, the destruction of the Armenian Christian population of Nagorno-Karabakh is the goal. We don't know exactly how that's going to happen yet or if it can be prevented, but please don't look away. Please keep following this. This is far from over.